climate leadership stories. We have Janice Steele who looks at climate leadership stories across the Pacific. Rodrigo Machado Moreira, who looks at agroecology in Brazil, and Leanne Usher, who looks at commons-based money as an alternative economic system. So if you do have any questions for any of the speakers, you can write these into the chat function, and we'll go through these at the end of the webinar, or at the end when you want to put your hand up, we can come to you and ask questions. So to begin, I will hand over to Janice Steele, who can tell us about the work that she does and her piece in the book. Great, hi, thank you. Um, so I want to begin uh, today by acknowledging that I'm speaking with you from the beautiful, oops, beautiful traditional uh, lands and waters of the Mi'kmaq people. And particularly I'm located in the territory of the Wekoma First Nation. Uh, you may be more familiar with the name Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, uh, which is where I am. Uh, so New Scotland, so I'm not so disconnected from Scotland's climate fringe week, I suppose, in that regard. Um, I also want to thank ArcBound for the opportunity to uh, share my writing and this talk and uh, the stories from the Pacific that um, I'm sharing with you today. So um, if we could just have the opening slide from uh, folks at ArcBound, we'll see if that comes up here. All right, so here we go. All right. So hang on a second while we get this uh, in place here. All right, great. So um, there's the title of my uh, essay or my chapter in the book, Stories from the Blue Continent, Women, Activists, Allies, and Radical Difference. Um, so I've set out to do a couple of things in this chapter, as the title suggests. I hope. First, I'm introduced readers to several Pacific Islander women, just a few among many, who are theorizing, um, acting on, engaging the climate emergency and environmental degradation. Uh, second, I do that, or I do this process with great concern and caution. Um, as an ally and a storyteller, I want to keep in mind that all too often, in the name of solidarity, authors and activists who occupy a position of privilege stake a claim to representing marginalized peoples that ends up sidelining them in, in that process. Uh, so I don't strive to give voice to these Pacific women. Um, perhaps this is more akin to kind of shouldering in to uplift these voices, though I'm not even sure that's the best way of uh, putting it. Um, so I approach this notion of allyship as a work of uh, ethical, intellectual, and emotional decolonization. And to me, to be an ally is to engage the active and consistent and really arduous practice of unlearning and reevaluating the ways in which modernity and coloniality or colonialism have worked and continue to work to negate or distort and deny different knowledges and subjectivities and thereby threaten our very planet, as we're talking about today. I'm deeply inspired by a quote from an Aboriginal collective in Australia, and I'll share it with you now. It goes like this. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. So this is a really important framing for what I write about, and I encourage you to keep this this perspective in mind as I go through my talk today. I won't go into too much detail about the women um, that I speak about in the book, um, but I'll just give you some insights into the region as well as some short updates since my writing of the chapter. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. So here we have a map of the world. Uh, I'm a human ecologist and an anthropologist by training. And I consider maps to be powerful tools for conveying information and shaping our reality, our sense of reality. Whether they're translating the spherical planet into a flat image or promoting certain political and social boundaries and ideologies, maps are far from neutral. Uh, you can see they're rather they're an artifact is my point and giving us modes of representation that shape our relations of power. So here, in this classic map of the world, and you can Google classic map 
and this is what comes up. And there are other maps um, that are, you know, Pacific centered, but this is this is sort of the, the, the classic version. And what you can see is um, that conventionally, classic maps are centered on the prime meridian or zero degrees longitude set at uh, Greenwich, London at the Royal Observatory. And that was done in 1675. Um, this scientifically arbitrary point on the globe helped really propel Britain's expansionist agendas and more to the point uh, for my talk today, split the Pacific Ocean in two relegating this vast area to, as you see, to either side of the map's outer edges. So this layout, I'd argue, sort of has a kind of an implication that the region is not very consequential or is kind of just empty blue water. Um, so this irony, you know, this is sort of, this is kind of what I'm going into to talk to is kind of bringing us back to this notion of the blue continent as the biggest continent on the world, in the world. Um, so these, even though this area has kind of disappeared on the map, the irony is that these places are, many of these places, low-lying Pacific islands are actually disappearing due to the climate emergency today. So let's go to the next slide here. We'll zoom in on the Pacific region. So you can see here the blue area, um, Polynesia, the green, Melanesia, that's where um, I work in, in Vanuatu. And then above that is uh, Micronesia. And early explorers to this region, when they were confronted with this vast expanses of water and over you know, 10,000 or more islands um, throughout the Pacific, they actually divided um, the Pacific into these three distinct regions, Polynesia, Melanesia, and Micronesia, based upon criteria that were proffered up as scientific fact, but were really quite subjective. Um, Polynesia simply means many islands. Micronesia means tiny islands, and Melanesia refers to the fact that the people in this region have more melanin or darker skinned, um, and so that is where the name came. So it sort of fits in with um, notions of race at that time as well. Um, so in fact, today, you know, when people think of the Pacific, the sort of uh, archetypal image is of Polynesia, um, and uh, a lot of romanticism that comes out of that notion as well. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see the popular representation of the region. Let's get there. Hang on. Sort of the popular film. Whoop, we moved out. Sliding on a sec. Coming back in. So what you'll see when it pops up <laughs> is a, a slide image of, uh, there we go, Moana. I don't know, it's a film I actually have not seen, um, but there's been a lot of, you know, from the Pacific, a lot of sort of discussion about how sort of the Polynesian woman um, in particular is kind of this archetypal image of the Pacific region. All right. so. We can go on to the next slide if that's going to work. Um, so in recent years, Pacific Island states have been working to change how they're perceived and engaged with upon the world stage. So rather than being viewed as small island states, um, Pacific Island countries are positioning themselves, themselves as a large ocean states um, and part of, a part of the world's largest oceanic continent. And particularly um, in this regard, their people are, view, are experience themselves as the, as the custodians of this vast region's rich marine life and ocean health. So you can see here in this slide, uh, the common ocean identity, ocean geography, ocean resources, and the blue ocean continent. And surrounding are the, the flags of the countries in the region. Uh, you see in these values here, an emphasis on an inseparable link between the ocean and Pacific Island peoples where the ocean is core in shaping their values, traditional practices and spiritual connections. So I wanna say, we'll just leave this up, but uh, this image up for the moment. Um, in the Pacific region, people have done very little to contribute to the climate emergency. Um, but at the same time, they face enormous impacts from it, 
sea level rise, uh, increased cyclone intensity, category fives are commonplace now, uh, warming and acidification of the oceans and the, and the die off of coral reefs, which are such important ecosystems for their um, food sovereignty and livelihoods. Um, but at the same time, drowning islands feature prominently in the media, stories about climate change in the Pacific and Pacific Islanders appear kind of as voiceless, hapless victims um, and poster children of the emergency that we're facing. So in my essay, I refer to the work of two Pacific Island scholars who look at how uh, global warming and accompanying biodiversity loss are really seen, uh, are really only seen as new in the global north or Eurocentric societies. And for indigenous peoples like in the Pacific, caught up in centuries of resource extraction, slavery, dislocation, missionism, introduced diseases, ecosystem lost, loss, nuclear testing, of course, uh, pipelines, and all uh, sorts of neoliberal development agendas, the crisis has been ongoing for hundreds of years. So climate grief in this way is nothing new to Pacific Islanders. Um, I myself have been working in Vanuatu, Melanesia for the past eight years, uh, where I've partnered with a volunteer network of in environmental stewards known as the Vanuatai, and that means of land and sea. And these are men and women committed to action on behalf of their local communities. And I've engaged directly with those communities across the island chain on a variety of environmental uh, projects, climate adaptation projects, and I've worked in consultation there with government departments and others in the nonprofit sector. Um, these activities have also led me to meet a lot of people in the climate uh, action sphere, uh, 350 Pacific, um, Pacific Climate Action Network, uh, Pacific Island Students Fighting Climate Change. Um, and I've also had the opportunity to speak with women across Vanuatu as part of producing two short documentaries about women's climate and environmental leadership. One of the stories I helped document was the building of a traditional canoe in Vanuatu, which became part of a small fleet of Pacific Islander canoes. You can go to the next slide, um, thank you. Which were taken to Australia to protest the coal industry and shipping. Um, this was a 350 Pacific campaign and it uses the slogan, we're not drowning, we're fighting, which references back to this question of agency rather than victimhood. So this canoe you see here was, uh, we watched, we have a video of the cutting of this tree and um, the carving and the launching of this canoe in, in Vanuatu. And then it was taken to, to Australia where you see it here in this, this image is the name of the canoe is Tereo, which means the voice of Vanuatu. And this picture was taken during them, their day of action where they literally put themselves in the path of giant uh, coal ships and, and in the port. Um, as we're speaking this week, as in Scotland with Climate Fringe, there are a lot of actions taking place in the Pacific region as well. Um, and right now there's a gathering taking place today, uh, yesterday and today called Youth for Pacific. And if you could take us to the next slide, please. It's a two day event um, with all kinds of workshops and artists from every region in the Pacific, joining Pacific youth from all around the world. And their mission is to unify youth um, advocacy and engagement in climate policy in the lead up to COP26. And they'll culminate in the formulation and endorsement of a youth Pacific declaration on climate change. If you go to the next slide, um, this is one of the workshops that is taking place. And two, you'll see two of the, it features two of the women um, that I talk about in my chapter, Noeline Nabulibu of Diva for Equality, which is a radical feminist collective in Fiji. And on the upper right, Kathy Jetnell Kitchener of the Marshall Islands, uh, who received international acclaim for a powerful poetry performance of a letter she wrote to her infant daughter. Um, that she performed at the opening of the 2014 United Nations Climate Summit in New York, and that's available to watch on YouTube. Um, loss and damage is a key focus 
for uh, many Pacific Islanders. And in my essay, I talk about two young women involved with the Pacific Island students fighting climate change. Um, if you go to the next slide, this is a young organization whose core campaign is focused on convincing governments to seek an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice concerning legal obligations related to environmental treaties and human rights. And you see on the bottom uh, left there, Solomon Yo, who's from the Solomon Islands. Uh, he's one of the founders of that group. But in my essay, I talk about two of the women participants and they're uh, leading a program right now, pilot project, uh, building um, mentorship or offering mentorship for young Pacific climate activists. Um, moving right along to the next one, the last group of folks I want to introduce you today is the Vanuatu Women Monitors that I mentioned briefly before. Um, these are some of the women, yeah, right here, some of the women with whom I've been closely allied on uh, all different kinds of projects in new and numerous workshops across Vanuatu. Uh, these women really help lead the way in their communities in protecting ecosystems, brokering traditional and scientific knowledge, which is a really you know, complex terrain, and uplifting their communities. And they, um, they're really in the process of, of doing something really unique, both invigorating cultural traditions and as well as interrogating those traditions as women leaders. Um, some of the examples, if you go to the next slide, so um, there's a woman on the left, Anita, She's an environmental leader in her community. We'll get that up in a second, yep. Anita making, giving a presentation there on ecosystem threats. Um, and she's also an entrepreneur who does shell crafting and trains other women in this livelihood project. And you can see I'm wearing some uh, shell crafted jewelry today. <laughs> um, and then in the next slide, uh, Anita and, and her fellow Vanuatu monitors, men and women, and members of her community here, they are working on a reforestation project, building a nursery um, to plant because like, like many places in the world, deforestation uh, it occurs in Vanuatu as well. Um, in this next slide, we have um, Lisa V. Joel, a woman I've worked closely with here on the left. And what she's doing is we are very involved in a lot of coral nursery projects. So she's stringing coral fragments into a rope and that will be positioned in a coral nursery bed in the ocean. Uh, Lacey is also a mother, a farmer, an entrepreneur, and a planter of mangroves as well as coral. And she's an advocate for fish and turtles. So in nearly every instant, she's hands in and hands on. And she features in several of our videos that we have on our Island Reach YouTube channel. And she's a passionate um, climate uh, activist and speaker on behalf of her community. And then in the next slide, um, the, getting to the end here, we have uh, Risu. She was an intern with uh, us and is a leader in spurring women's surfing in Vanuatu. And she takes that leadership role and leads her um, Salwara sisters in building reef awareness. And uh, they're managing a coral nursery together. And here she's doing the same thing, stringing a rope. So um, I think I'll just wrap that up there and I hope you are enticed to read the book and uh, you can check out our website, Island Reach. And uh, thank you so much for giving me the time to share these stories today. Thanks. I look forward to your questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janice, for that talk. It was really interesting. So if we move on next to Rodrigo to give his talk. I'll just mute and take my video off. Hi there. Uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, thank you, Janice, uh, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you, and uh, I appreciate very much the opportunity to be uh, with this wonderful team at the Arcbound Foundation book, very proud of it. And I'm going to be speaking with you about local, local agroecological transition. Uh, this is a result of my uh, research for the last 20 years in, at Botucatu, Sao Paulo, Brazil, um, my hometown. 
I'm gonna share my screen here with you so I can I can give you uh, some illustration of, of what I'm gonna say for now. Uh, I guess you're seeing my presentation now. Okay, so uh, I, I'm gonna start of uh, on doing four questions, four basic questions, and I'm gonna try to respond them. Uh, I'll be glad to respond to other questions from the ones who are participating here after uh, we all talk. Uh, the first one is why agroecology? Why is that? And what? Uh, and for us in Brazil, what is agroecology? Um, why and what is the local uh, agroecological transition uh, important? What it is? And, uh, and if we succeed, what can happen at the local level if we succeed on our journey of building public policies and social process that can manage uh, a very deep transition into a sustainable food system at the local level, right? So why agroecology? Because our food system is really organized in the past 70 years uh, in such a way that is helping uh, very fast to, to, to destroy our planet, basically. It has everything to do with global warming and climate change. And, and uh, the actual agricultural model uh, may not cross this bridge and it won't cross this bridge. Uh, this is made uh, by Sebastião Pinheiro uh, at the Fundação Juquira Candiru. It's a cartoon that uh, shows the, the real challenges that our agroindustrial complex face uh, when it speaks of moving towards sustainability, right? It's a very heavy, uh, uh, it's a very heavy complex. So it may not cross that bridge after all, right? So why agroecology? Because the current agricultural model can contaminate systematic, systematically our soil and our water and so on and people who works in the factories of the pesticides, who put them on the fields and who consumes um, the food with levels of residues of ver a various, uh, a lot of a wide variety of pesticides, right? So we cannot from it, uh, run from it. Um, it gets into our, our water, right? Levels of glyphosate, it's the most used herbicide in the world, uh, has gone up threefold in five years. Uh, as we analyze data from 2014 and 2017. And in 2014, we found like five, four micrograms per liter uh, in lots of uh, points of collection of water. And four years later, three to four years later, we are already seeing 100 micrograms per liter, uh, considering multiple uh, spots of analysis. So we, we have already data showing that this is going on and 100 micrograms per liter is a thousand times uh, uh, higher than the maximum permitted level at the European Union, but it's still uh, above, uh, um, it's not above of our national uh, limit, which is, uh, thousand times, um, 5,000 times higher than the UK and the, the European Union levels, right? So, but the levels are going up. So we have this data showing what we were saying for the past 40 years, right? Uh, with the ecology research and everything. So because also uh, uh, it's, a, it's a model anti-biodiversity basically, right? This is not a new for, for everyone, but it's, um, it's growing and it's spreading over forests. We're changing the use of land in Brazil, still in vast areas of Amazonia and this uh, Cerrado biomes. We're still going on with the same model. And I could go on for days here saying why agroecology is important, but I'm gonna uh, try to respond Another thing in Brazil, why 
what is agroecology? Uh, agroecology, it's a transdisciplinary science that involves various sciences, including the local knowledge uh, from the people that are dealing with, uh, are co-evoluting with the natural systems for hundreds and thousands of years. So we have a, 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 a strong dialogue uh, between natural and social sciences. This is one part of agroecology. Other one is a multiple sets of practice of ecology-based practices uh, that are being developed uh, by the small farmers uh, for thousands of years. So we have multiple practices that are not being used by the modern agriculture, right? So we got to rescue that. And it is agriculture in Brazil. It is a social and political movement also. Um, it's a social movement. It's a, a junction and uh, intersection of a, lot of a lot of movements. It's movements for land, to have access to land, Move, movements defending biodiversity, movements defending the role, role of women uh, in agriculture, the youth movements. It's a lot of movements, anti-racism that encounters uh, in, in, within agroecology. So that's what, uh, how we see agroecology in Brazil, right? But why transition? Because um, it is, everyone knows, there is the green revolution inertia that I'm calling, right? Uh, there's a lot of inertia on the system going on and this is very hard to, to change it. Why is hard? Because it is a scientific system that brought us here. So it's very hard to change the paradigm, uh, to change the paradigm at sciences, right? Uh, so technicians, researchers, professors, input corporations, all of them are engaged in advocating uh, to advance this industrial uh, food system. And we have agrochemicals and synthetic, synthetic uh, fertilizers dependency. We depend on oil to uh, grow our food um, in Brazil and the whole world. And corporate biotechnology, each time more, it's a greater monopoly, right? And they control policies and they put money into the universities and research centers and put lobbyists in the Congress, in the National Congress, and the credit system, the banking still pushes uh, this kind of system, right? So industrial food system paradigm or regime is still going on and we're not gonna change it if we don't try the local uh, alternative. And why it is important, the local alternative? Because we have some space of maneuver at local level right? Because top-down policies are too fragile. See what's going on with this uh, actual government that we have in Brazil, right? Lots of setbacks in all areas, right, of the development agenda. So neoliberalism, it is demolishing and not just Brazil's, but other states' capacity to, to build strong quality public policies, right? So um, the space is very narrow now, for political agroecology and, and, and always, right? And from the top down perspective, we don't have uh, so, um, it is very hard to build federal or state policies nowadays uh, with the actual government that we have. And authoritarian governments can really promote serious setbacks, strong private corporations and lobbyist think tanks they dominate the national and the state level. That's why we need um, we need people's power party <laughs> at the local level because if there is some space, it is at the local area, right? And food movements at the local area, uh, uh, they are very important, right? Building social participation towards uh, public policies, building that can guarantee really the human right to good food, to adequate food, food security and sovereignty, um, environmental health and sustainable rural development based on family farming or small farmers uh, empowerment, right? We're destroying local communities and family farming in Brazil. We need to empower local, small and medium 
food producers and the actual systems are destroying uh, them. So my, our, our proposal that we've been discussing for the last 20 years at Botucatu, uh, it has clearly three dimensions, right? It's a cultural dimension that we talk about. Uh, there is a strong technological and production change that we need to do. And there is a political and social change that we need to do also. So uh, local agroecological transition, what, what it is it? What is it, right? So for us, local agroecological transition can be defined as a set of endogenous and participatory a social process aiming and reflecting gradual transitions from the current local food system to another one governed by ecological principles, methods, and technologies, right? right? And as agroecological transitions move forward, right, uh, developed at the farm level, uh, support and guidance are needed uh, via, via market formation, uh, public policy building, implementation and development and monitoring. So these policies shall invest and govern necessary changes for the local food production and consumption. Um, considering agroecological rural extension uh, partnerships uh, to get into dialogue, into a, a, a very creative dialogue with the farmers and other agents uh, and other stakeholders and participatory research, uh, permanent education and communicative process, communication process, and social and organizational networks, uh, recognition, formation of the new networks and promotion of them, right? So uh, it has a very a clear objective, right? It's to build public policy, mobilize people for that and practical experiences in the territory they serve as, as what you called in agroecology as agroecological lighthouses, right? Anchored by local networks around a system of values, thought and action that's really compatible with the change process that farmers go through and consumers has to go through. And social forces contained into our local movements articulated through forms of, of collective social action, then therefore we can increase people's organization for a healthy, sustainable, nutritional, nutrition sensitive and inclusive local food system. So it's about changing our local food system, right? This is a schematic representation of our proposal, right? So we have this social political dimension uh, that is very important. So let's talk about science. Let's talk about what technology we need, what shift in te the technology and science we have to do to make it feasible, uh, social institutions creating and empowering social institutions and uh, uh, public policies, right? So we have to educate and train into agroecology. We have to do participatory research in agroecology. Uh, we have to build programs to talk about uh, rural extension, technical assistance uh, for the farmers. Uh, we have to build social uh, control over public policies. We have to participate into the councils. We have to advocate, right? At the local level, it's easier to do at the local level. And we have to build rural development uh, agenda uh, so we can uh, really make the reproduction uh, or social reproduction of the family farming feasible. So we have to uh, establish at the local level a system uh, which can guarantee food sovereignty and security at the local level. Okay, so this is the most common known that I'm, I'm calling the eco-structural uh, uh, dimension, uh, which, which goes from producing at local level and marketing at the local level, right? So designing and redesigning the agroecosystems, uh, uh, building seed banks and breeds that are actually really resistant to climate change and uh, adapted to local conditions. Um, uh, selective rural collection and composting of urban waste. We have to compost our urban waste, uh, recovery our environment, uh, planting trees, recovering our fonts, our, our, our sources of water, uh, 
promoting direct and indirect marketing, marketing of the good food produced locally, uh, adding value to small scale uh, uh, agricultural product production, income diversification in rural areas, and uh, to rethink the relationship between uh, towns, the city and the rural, the rural space, right? So, and the other uh, dimension, it's the social cultural dimension, right? It involves uh, mobilization, cooperation, and communication permanently, permanently at the local level. So uh, all sorts of collective social actions are needed to be established to move forward with the local agroecological transition, social cooperation and econ solidarity economy, uh, other kinds of economy, empowering uh, rural women and youth uh, because they naturally, they lead this process of change. Uh, access to water and land at the local level um, and also uh, empower uh, the family farming uh, at the small scale production at the, at, at the local level. So make the consumption, the consumers more um, aware of the things that are going on with our food and, and build and reinforce and support local peasant culture right? Because we're talking about a struggle of cultures, right? It's, uh, it's a war that we're playing against local cultures uh, with the, this globalization uh, uh, and this crazy system that we built at the, at the global level. So advancing local uh, agroecological transition requires really guaranteeing social cooperation in these three dimensions, okay? So eco-structural, social, political, and social cultural dimension. So uh, what if we succeed with our proposal? What if we really succeed? What will can happen? What can happen at the local level, right? What can happen if we succeed? But, well, we're gonna have a higher number of farmers engaged in designing and managing sustainable agroecosystem resilience to climate, uh, resilient to climate change, right? Due to global warming worsening. So we have also uh, to recycle our local nutrients that comes from our food that we consume and get back into organic fertilizers for the farmers. We're still uh, not composting our urban fertile, our urban waste, right? So it's a lot of energy to be dumped into the landfills and creating more global warming gas. So uh, we need better seeds, we're gonna have better seeds and animals really resistant and adapted to local farmer conditions, right? We're gonna have uh, an increase in the local uh, agroecological food supply uh, at a fair price at the local level. We're gonna, uh, uh, have a, we're gonna have a closer relationship between producers and consumers. We're gonna create value for this good food, the real food that family farmers produce in Brazil. 70% of our whole food is produced by family farmers, right? So we're gonna have a better condition so family farmer can really, really socially reproduce itself. So we're gonna have a reduction at the local ecological uh, uh, consumer. Uh, uh, we're gonna have a We're gonna have a, a, a reduction on the local ecological footprint uh, related to food consumption, okay? What else we're gonna have? We're gonna have a greater number of, um, I have a little trouble here. We're, we're gonna have more consumers engaged into the consuming this good food produced locally. We're gonna have greater public resources investments towards uh, healthy, sustainable, inclusive food systems. Because if we don't invest in the change of the system, we're, gonna, we're, go we're not gonna change the system, right? So we're gonna have more people engaged uh, at the local food system. We're gonna have a higher appreciation of women and youth role in agriculture, which is fundamental. We're gonna have a stronger countryside culture. We're gonna have better and access to land, right? And empower our small uh, food producers 
We're going to have live and better soils, better quality of water. We're going to have access to health. Uh, we're going to have uh, we're going to have a, a, a telecommunications at the rural area, good telecommunication culture, and opportunities to generate income uh, from uh, a high quality uh, local food production. We're going to have clean. We're going to clean our water. Uh, of pesticides and our soils. We're gonna have a more participatory educational process, researchers, rural extensionists to boost local agroecological transition. We're gonna have an increase in soil uh, biologic conservation uh, value, right? We're gonna have a greater food sovereignty and we're gonna reach a human right to adequate food. We're gonna have more participation, social control and intersectoral tools to foment public support for local food system redesign. So, and finally, I think we're gonna have less poverty and we're gonna have more opportunities for local farmers to develop themselves based on social uh, inclusion and a social economy, right? So I think that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm available for other questions. Further questions, thank you. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. Another really important and interesting talk. Um, and it's exciting that this will be featured in the book. So finally, last but not least, if we move on to Leanne and Leanne can give her talk. Hello, everybody. Um, Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you so much for Arcbound for um, helping us with this wonderful publication. I'm so I'm, it's such an honor to be with the 35 some authors that are part of this part of this book. Uh, let's see if I am sharing my screen. Is that correct, Emily? I, oops. Yeah, I think, I think I'm good, right? I think you're sharing, you're, you can see my screen. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm having such, some difficulties here. Okay. Um, so, Right. So um, if I'm if yeah, so I, I'm I'm presenting here with um, not just uh, let me just make sure I'm sharing my screen because I feel like I'm not. <laughs> Sorry, your sheet, your screen was being shared, but we could see the zoom. Oh, here we go. There we go. Here That's we go. Perfect. Okay, yeah. better. Good. All right. Great. Um, so I'm 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 part of a cohort of five authors who have written a paper about systems change, and our focus is on the monetary system. So, and I'm so glad to follow Janice and Rodrigo because um, there is so much commonality between you know all the papers in this book, obviously. Uh, so we're. Let me just start with describing for you um, the, just the outline of the paper uh, that we have in the book. So basically, we're saying that monetary systems are designed. And the important um, component of that is that they're not value free. So they're laden with value. In my presentation today, I'm going to talk about two monetary systems, which I'm going to call mud and gold, just as two extremes of the spectrum. In our paper, we don't, um, we're very theoretical. Uh, so today's presentation will be more of an overview uh, with some visuals. And so let's start with mud. Now, I, I want to describe um, this mud uh, civilization, which goes back, um, you know, 
12, 12, 12,500 uh, BC, when there were lots of ancient civilizations that were built up on riverbanks. And those, you know, delta zones, those um, mud flats had, um, had a lot of innovation and they used what they had. And what they had at the time was a lot of mud. And we know that writing uh, was using mud um, palettes that we can look here. I've got a timeline and the um, calculations, numerical calculations would, would have been done with either tokens made out of mud or um, tablets made out of mud. But not only did they build their cities out of mud, but they made money out of mud. And this money is the opposite to, way, to the way we think of money today. And in our paper, we emphasize that the fish is the last to know what water is because they're swimming, they're swimming in it, obviously, and they, and they don't really can't distinguish what's the difference. But we believe that, and, and many um, economists and um, theoreticians and practitioners understand this very well, is that we don't really understand what money is. And in Mesopotamia, in Mesopotamia mud um, was what you could create money out of. <clears throat> it was completely democratic. <clears throat> Everyone had access to it and you could create with, with that access to that mud, you could create your own money. <clears throat> so how, did, how might you think about this? So with, with the mud, you can create tokens. You can create simple tokens, which are counting devices. And these um, simple tokens here could represent things like bread or goats or wine or oil. Um, the simple ones would be counted as units and the more complex ones would be for, you know, let's say three um, baskets of bread and, and seven um, jars of wine, etc. But when you combine these tokens into what's called an envelope, you can create a promissory note. And that promissory note <clears throat> is a form of money. So how would you do this? Well, um, you can use a cylinder seal, which is a um, stone, which might be a little more scarce than the mud. The mud is, is um, all over the place, but people would have their own cylinder stone. They would, sil uh, sorry, um, cylinder um, seal. They would have their own cylinder seal, which they would even wear around their necks as jewelry. And you could take some mud, roll it into a, um, a cord and push out your seal. So you could push out your seal here. And if you enclosed that seal into an envelope, something like um, is being fashioned here, and you put, let's say this, this promissory note, this seal is going to be a promise of some future good. Let's say it is the promise of a, of a shepherd who wants to buy grain now, but doesn't have anything to um, barter with. And so he can make instead this IOU and he can put on the outside, he can take his goat tokens and imprint the goat tokens onto the envelope and seal it up such that you end up with this um, bole or envelope, clay envelope. And that clay envelope is entirely encompassed with a seal so that if there is tampering with it, so when he sealed this up, he, he remembered to put his tokens of goats inside. So maybe he wanted to sell five goats. He doesn't have any goats. He wants to buy wheat, puts his five tokens of goats inside the clay, seals it up and passes it to the person selling the wheat. <clears throat> and so the money that's designed here is this clay mud money that can now circulate around in a system of reciprocity. So the issuer, here's the shepherd. The shepherd will issue, create his promise, his IOU, 
in exchange for wheat. This can circulate around town, around the community, and come back, maybe a butcher or a cheese um, maker will come back to his um, to him in five months time. He will know that this is his IOU. This is what he owes to this community. He owes five goats and he can now give it to the issuer, to the shepherd, who looks at it, checks it hasn't been tampered with and validates it, verifies it, understands that there's no double spend problem. There's no excessive printing of money here. And he knows it's his, and so he can destroy it and give the goats. And hence, you have a money here that is based on reciprocity. What the money is ensuring is that what you receive is what you can give. And in this community, everyone will be um, giving and receiving goods. It's not barter because it's not uh, one good for another good. It is a multilateral trading and clearing system. And it's made out of mud. It's not scarce at all. And it's available for everyone. Now come to today's system. Today's system is a hierarchy of money. And if I was to break this down for you, it's a hierarchy of money that originally began with goldsmiths and gold. So gold for whatever reason was was valued and was held safe with goldsmiths who would issue a receipt for that gold and sometimes they would issue many more receipts than what they actually have as gold but what the promise was was that they had gold backing these receipts but since they could issue more the triangle the 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 base of money the money base rather than using gold as, as, the, as the money, you could use receipts of gold, just like we do um, in today's world, we use receipts of our money, which is our checks. So you could re use receipts of gold and you could even use receipts of receipts of gold. So what, what we're talking about here is a whole hierarchy of a banking system that is focused on private property that private property is the gold and the leverage, um, the leverage receipts on top of that gold. Now, this system treats money as scarce, scarce, but leveraged. And there's many problems with this system because if we turn it on its actual base, which is where it should be sitting, the base is the gold, and then there is a fractional reserve, there's bank deposits, and then there's um, government bonds. Um, the reserves today have now morphed and disappeared. It's not actual gold, but it's still monopoly controlled bank, um, central bank reserves, supposedly backing those checks, which are bank deposits. And the private sector can create this, can create this money, just as the shepherd was able to create this money. But this money isn't meant to be extinguished. This money actually in, in, a, in economic growth, this money expands. And when there's a downcline, this money contracts. So this money is said to be pro-cyclical. It expands at the worst time, it contracts at the worst time. It's moving in the opposite direction to what we would like to, for it to happen. And therefore it's, it's very unstable and it creates an unstable world. And in the book, we list five problems with national money. So one is that it's unstable and pro-cyclical. Another one is that money leaks out. You uh, might be in the global South and you're dependent on US dollars in order to buy your imports and so you export goods. Um, but that money isn't necessarily um, going to stay and be spent just on your imports or financing your imports. It could leak out for other reasons. It also, by having that kind of system where you're dependent on money being injected from outside, um, you are no longer um, 
protecting your own industries and your own infant industries and your own network of connections. And Jane Jacobs was a big proponent of local currencies. And she was emphasizing that you need a network, you need a mesh, a dense network between your partners, between your community members, between uh, participants in your country in order to make the pathways for innovation and for growth. But if you are, if those networks are porous and not as densely connected and you're dependent on external goods because you're dependent on external money, then um, those things can, it, it, it can be a good thing, it can be a bad thing, but often we see the vulnerability that takes place. And so <clears throat> that's another problem with a national money or a hierarchy of money. So the US dollar is, is um, a hierarchical money that is the world reserve currency. And it's the one that everyone wants and it's the one that leaks out of the periphery of the places that can't maintain it and it runs off to the financial centers. So we don't want it to leak out. We want it to stay in the community because every time money is spent in a community, it creates income every single time it goes around. Another problem um, that we list is that today's national money has um, meant to have three functions, a store of value, a medium of exchange, and a unit of account. Now, the store of value and the medium of exchange is actually in, in complete conflict with each other. When you have a store of value, you have a tendency not to spend it. You have a tendency to hold it and to hoard it and keep it until some future day that you decide to invest it. You hold on to it because there's, there's value in having something that is liquid. It's valuable to hold on to because this is something that everyone else values and it's liquid, meaning that you can exchange it for something else very, very quickly and very easily to make investments. So it's often a speculative decision to hold on to globs of cash. And we know this in our companies today, our companies have, uh, have excess holdings of cash. They're not investing into their, into their communities. They're very profitable, but their focus is on maximizing their profits, share buybacks, raising the share price so that they can um, uh, get more investment and their, their circuit of, of production has been failing. And we have the deindustrialization that we see in the United States because it has moved itself to a financialization of its economy. And that is because of this focus of money as a store of value, that money in and of itself is something that we need to hold on to and have access to um, for, Specu often speculative, but also um, purposes that are tied to the individual corporation rather than thinking in a commons where the understanding is if I spend this, it's going to come back to me. So that's the, that's the commons uh, version. So this sovereign money with, with the head of the state, um, often a gold is also could be considered commodity money. So the, the focus on store value and commodity money. Let's think of it in a different way. Uh, my, I grew up with my mom who was a dressmaker and sold fabric. And we always had this wonderful customer who would always come and spend a lot of money. And her statement was money was made, is made round to go around. And <laughs> It definitely gave us a blessing when she came and spent it. And when we spent it somewhere else, it would help someone else. And so the fact that, you know, that these coins are round is not to, I would encourage you not to think about the head of the state or the, the, the intrinsic value of their gold, but that they are there to go around and circulate. And if we go back to the, um, shepherd and his community, that money is there to clear the multilateral um, desire to trade and to barter with each other, not barter, to, to overcome barter, 
by having something that can clear the system. The other problem, apart, you know, so we just spoke about the conflicting media, store of value versus medium of exchange. Another problem is that it's undemocratic. Today's national money is totally undemocratic. In the United States <clears throat> and the world, the, um, the head of the Federal Reserve will pump out a lot of money and it ends up with Wall Street. It's not ending up <clears throat> with Main Street. It's not accessible for production by Main Street. It's only accessible by production by a central bank that is, um, you know, is its shareholders are the banks. And it is there to stabilize the banking system, which we knew, which we know from a previous slide, that is, is inherently unstable. <clears throat> so it's very undemocratic. And uh, I think lastly, the treatment of money as a thing. This comes back to the store of value. Usually we think about money as evolving from barter. So it's always a thing. It's always a pot, you know, a treasure chest. It's always something that we should hold on to and hoard. It's not thought of as we're in a commons where we interact with each other and we need to spend it in order to earn it. There's not that uh, thinking of the greater good. Rather, it's an obsession with private property. So we have reconceptualized money um, <clears throat> in this paper and we note these five elements that should be part of reconceptualizing money. One, we can live in a world of pluralism of money. We can have special purpose money. We don't have to have just one kind of money. We're not saying that we're going to replace national currency. It can stay. But what we're saying is that there's opportunities for an alternative and for people to create their own kind of money. <clears throat> there's no reason that we need um, interest. You can have an interest-free money. Uh, again, this reduces the desire to hoard and hold on to money, which is what we don't want. We want money not to be scarce, not to be giving a return. We just want money to, to uh, achieve our productive purposes in the real economy, not in the financial economy, in the real economy. And um, we believe it shouldn't be convertible to a national currency. So um, capital controls, on nations is now the IMF recognizes as, as valid. Uh, for a long time, they were saying, no, this is not a good idea. Money should be floating and flexible. It's the same thing for communities. We should not necessarily think that all money has to be convertible to other kinds. It can be something that is for a special purpose and there might be a cost to conversion. <clears throat> It should have clear boundaries, look, and, and this is tied to that clear boundaries and that it should be more democratic. So the purpose of this paper is to just introduce the, the lay person to the many, many, many theories out there on complementary currencies and on the fact that anyone can create a money. The trick is having it accepted, but anyone can actually create it. So we have community money, and I'm just gonna run through these quickly. There's many different types of community currencies out there. The first, one of the famous um, ones was LETS, local exchange trading systems. In 1983, Michael Linton um, began with, with a LETS, which was a local uh, mutual credit. It's one of those clearing systems, but as I have shown, this, this idea of designing money in a way that promotes reciprocity and clearing has been around before writing. So this is not a, a new idea. Community exchange systems in Australia in 2003, they began a, a website where they can put all the communities can list what they have to offer and create a clearing house. Sardex is one of the more famous and successful um, local currencies on the island of Sardinia. The reason it, taking those principles of clearing, the reason that it is successful is that it's managed well. Local currencies aren't something that you can just um, create willy-nilly and think you can um, produce them at, you know, 
at will. You have to focus on this idea that you're being, you're producing this money for reciprocity purposes. And that means you're producing it for the community. Reciprocity does not talk about one person and their wealth. It talks about two people at minimum and their exchange. In Pittsburgh, there's a local currency that promotes volunteers to work with composting, planting trees. And with that currency, you can use your token to expand at the local stores and local shops. In Kenya, there's very uh, there's a number of uh, thriving local currencies. Will Ruddock has an, uh, a whole slew of them, maybe 12 in Southern Kenya and Esther, the lead author of this paper in Kusumu also is um, working in Kenya on local currencies. We can have programmable money. So the money today doesn't have to be this paper form. It can be digital. And once it's digital, you can program it, which means that you can actually potentially do things with this, with, with programmable money that you can't do otherwise. And this is simply a mapping to emphasize something that I'm working on, which is where, how consumers can actually track the supply chain and the carbon credits in a supply chain for them to be responsible for carbon emissions. And, you know, that, that, you know, you, one would have to explain that a little bit more for you to understand it fully, but it's tied to a local currency. There are in the blockchain world, there are companies like Holochain, which is working for the global commons. There are ideas about tokens used for forests and food. And it was so interesting um, with Rodrigo's talk but there's so many different ways to use tokens to create this reciprocity. And it's all up to the design of the system. The design is up to you. One system that I designed is a koala coin. This is completely hypothetical, but it's a way to promote koala safe products. So a koala safe product, whether it's paper or a bed would be something that the wood comes from a forest um, that is a private forest, not a koala forest. So by diverting your purchases to those commercially produced products from commercially produced forests, you are um, protecting koalas and you pay a premium. And in the process of this, um, you, there's a way that you can use a coin to promote this. Now there's many, many different um, community currencies out there. And Matthew Slater has, proposed a way for these local uh, currencies to connect with each other. So we don't just wanna be insulated and insular and only trade amongst ourselves. We wanna trade with the rest of the world and with others and with other communities that we wanna trade with, but we need to do it in a balanced way. And, and that is what is key. And so you have this meta, um, this larger global, uh, mutual credit exchange system with many different local currencies um, below it. And of course, he can correct me because I can see he's here in our audience if I've said something wrong. Now, if we're re reconceptualizing the, the um, digital commons, there are events happening. There's a hack, a collabathon. It's not called a hackathon. It's called a collabathon happening in October, where they are inviting everyone from all around the world to come and join the digital commons to make often what is often the case digital tokens that are for lots of different um, reasons, primarily climate accounting, so measuring our carbon footprint or biodiversity. And so um, our paper was really about how can we rethink about the use for money and realize that we're fish in, a, in, a, in water and, and we don't always understand what this money is. We take it for granted. We just use it. We think it has to be scarce and it is what it is, but it's not. And we can take control and design that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leanne. That was really interesting. So we have a couple of minutes. Well, we have about 15 minutes now for some questions. 
So I'm just going to go to the questions that have already been asked. So firstly, we have a kind of a general question that can be answered by any of the authors. Um, so the question is, how do you think we can make it desirable to have less, even though there is constant advertising which encourage us to consume more? So if anyone just jumps in, if you have an answer to that. Well, um, in, in my, in my um, perception of the problem is that when advertisers are asking us to buy more at this cheaper price, we don't really know what we're buying. We, there's a whole slew of costs out there that are tied to that cheap purchase. And there's, um, there's a saying that there's no such thing as cheap food. When you buy food that's inexpensive, it means you're pushing the cost onto others. The social cost can be enormous. And so I think education is one way to do that, but also mandating that those externalities are, are either priced into that product or at least people understand through, you know, maybe a QR system, what are the costs involved by you going cheap? You know, I feel like maybe the others are on mute and can't respond. Would that be right, Ellie? Oh no, me first. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I wouldn't respond anything else than what you did, Leanne. Uh, thank you for the answer. That's it. We got to educate people. Uh, but in, in our country, in countries where people have little money to 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 buy food, this is a very complicated issue, right? The price of money, the price of food uh, that the people has really access to to food so um actually i didn't quite understand the fully question the full question so it's because my it's because of my my english not so good so it's, i'm sorry I, I understood part of it i i would just add i, I agree with leanne about the importance of pricing and externalities um i would say you know the importance of um getting young people, young children outside from an early age. Um, a lot of consumer cultures are people who are disconnected from the natural world as well. I mean, you know, when your emphasis is on great consumption. Um, but yeah, it's a very complicated question with, you know, that we could talk about for a very long time. But I, I think it, when Rodrigo was talking about um, the price of food in, in poorer countries or developing nations, there's many local currency um, solutions for stabilizing prices, although you do need to have the resources. So if it's a, if it's a matter of badly allocated resources, then a local currency can solve that. Thank you so much for your answers to that one. Um, so we have another question, which is, do you think it's a governmental responsibility to encourage communities to support localism? So do you think it's down to the government to try and encourage communities? I think it is because there's no uh, space for man maneuver space at the, uh, at the other levels, right? If everything is co-opted by the by, by the actual uh, development system and agricultural system, talking about agriculture, uh, we don't have, uh, and at the local level, we can reach out to politicians, we can reach out to the public policies. We don't have a, 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 um, a great budget, right? We don't have tons of money at the local level, but we have, we, we, we can reach out uh, into the other one, the ones that are uh, thinking the laws, the public uh, policies, and uh, also to the, the ones that are actually governing at the executive power. So we can reach out for partners uh, easily at the local level. 
My my feeling, um, just working in the town that I live in on Long Island, um, it's very hard to trust government partners because they have other interests. And my feeling is that, um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sort of hammering the same hammer, but um, our problem is coordination. It's not lack of money. And I think that if we get coordinating mechanisms for grassroots organizing, I mean, that's the reason we go to the government because the, the way the system is organized is through this hierarchical top down. But if there is a way to coordinate from the grassroots up, and again, a local currency is one way, but there are, there are many systems like that, then you have power. People have power. What they lack is coordination. That's all. So you can topple every government if you have coordination from the grassroots. Good, great answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we did have another question sent in, but it was quite similar to the previous question. So it was about political power. Um, and the question was, there's been a lot of talk about solutions and it's clear that many solutions are on the table, but the reason solutions are not being applied is because people in power don't want it. Shouldn't more of our strategies be about political power? I don't know if you have any um, different answers to that one. It ended up being quite similar to the, the government question. One one of the things that um, I address in in my essay is is uh, Pacific Islanders participating in the COP process, and that it is it. And Kathy Jetnell Kitchener calls it a very abusive process because it is so, um, uh, you know, it really is so power oriented and and maintaining the control of decision making in the hands of the powerful and the elite. So, uh, but you know, the position of a lot of these activists that I that I engage with is that um, they keep trying to find uh, innovative ways to to look to their uh, traditional practices or their traditional beliefs, their spiritual beliefs, and bring those into a public platform somehow. So right now, this mentorship program that's going on in the Pacific is looking to find ways to sort of help people bridge between um, those those sort of more spiritual or local perspectives and these these halls of power. But it it's it's very complicated. That's uh, you know, I mean, I, I think that's the same as my answer before. These these power processes are so complicated, and um, you know, I, I liked what you said, Leanne, about, you know, people have that power if they network. And I think that's, you know, what young people in the Pacific are trying to do right now, for example. Thanks. Yeah, it, it can help if we can communicate better our, our to alternatives, right? Because we, we, we don't have the means sometimes to communicate better with the people, uh, real communication. So I think that would help also to, better, to have a better strategies for communication uh, with the local uh, agenda and the other ones. <clears throat> Thank you. So Leanne, did you have anything else to add to that answer? Uh, only, only to say that I, I have a lot of hope um, that in our digital age that we're learning how to um, coordinate ourselves and communicate with each other and bring all of our decentralized units together. Right now, we're pretty much co-opted by the, by the top, the big companies like Facebook and, and, and Twitter and so forth. Um, but there is so much out there now that makes this possible um, that um, and my husband just passed me. Oh, you can't see it. <laughs> it says, it says uh, active hope. He, he's emphasizing that we, we do have to be hopeful. And I am very hopeful because of these digital technologies that coordination is possible. And once we have coordination, because I think everyone has that feeling, they want things to happen. So many people, not everyone, 
true. But so many people want things to happen. It really, the, the lacking, the thing that we lack is the coordination. And if we solve that, then I think we, we have a way, a path. That's great. Thank you. So I think that's it for questions, but potentially we're going to send a follow up email from this webinar and potentially if the authors are happy with it, if we can include your email addresses in the follow up email in case anyone has any additional questions that they'd like to send in. Um, so there are a couple of things that I wanted to mention just before we end the meeting. So firstly, we do have a link to pre order the book, if you'd like, um, and Ellie has put that on the chat function. The official launch date isn't until the 25th of October, but you can pre-order it here. Um, alternatively, if you just go to the Artbound website and look at our products, you can see it listed there. And the second thing I had to say that is that we have two upcoming in-person book launches, one in Glasgow and one in Bristol for anyone based in those areas. And the links to these will also be checked, will also be sent into the chat function. And the Glasgow event will be on the 30th of October, so five days after the book is released. And this will be in the Mitchell Library from 2 to 4 p.m. And that will also have three of our um, UK-based authors there. And then the Bristol event will be on the 9th of November from 7 to 9 p.m. at Waterstones in Broadmead. And this will be a joint book launch between this book and another book that Artbound is publishing by Morgan Phillips called Great Adaptations. So both events are free, so if you are based in either area, we'd love to see you there. And finally, again, a reminder to go to the Climate Fringe website, if you haven't already, to check out any more events going on this week. And thank you all so much for coming. And thank you again to the speakers um, for your really interesting talks. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, thank you Janice and Leanne. It's a pleasure thank you, to, everyone. to be with you mm -hmm. at this book. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. It's so nice to see your face and meet you. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> all right. Take care, okay, everyone. I hope we can see right. each other.